Good morning, everyone. It's uh, such a delight to be here. I really appreciate all the support to uh, make me feel welcome and to get me all set up here. So yes, picking up on those themes about what I'm passionate about um, and bringing love into the equation, I have titled my talk today, Learning to Fall in Love with the Land. Um, and the subtitle here is about human nature reconnection and rewilding environmental education, which is the, the thrust of my kind of new research area. And so with this invitation and with this picturesque image that I've put on the front uh, slide here, I would like you to not just think and analyze today, but invite yourself to feel and embody, sort of consider how what I'm sharing is resonating with you um, in, in a feeling way as well as in, a, in an analytical way. Um, I'm encouraging us to explore how we can build relationships for planetary healing, um, and I think that that involves connecting our head and our heart. So a couple of days ago, I was listening to a recording from John Young. I'll tell you more about who John Young is in a little bit. Um, and I've listened to many hours of, uh, of presentations by John Young, who's uh, really a, a mentor and uh, educator for folks who have started outdoor schools and wilderness awareness schools around the world. And he said something that really stuck with me. That was that sustainability education and nature connection are two totally different processes. And that just really... Um, hit a chord with me uh, as I've been exploring what are the modalities of nature connection? How do we encourage people to feel more connected? Um, and to realize that the way we do sustainability education is not reinforcing that. Um, so I invite you again to ponder that uh, kind of paradox um, in what I share today. Um, I've been struck by the parallels between what folks in the Nature Connection community, like Richard Louvre, who wrote the, um, about nature deficit disorder, um, and, and others have been saying about the disconnections in our society, and also what folks at, uh, for example, Otto Scharmer, who's co-founder of the Presencing Institute, and he's a business professor at MIT, and he's very well known about uh, complexity thinking and social innovation. Um, and he talks also about these three divides um, in society. The ecological divide, which is separating ourselves from nature. The social divide, which is separating ourselves from each other, a sense of community and a sense of kind of connection. Um, and a spiritual divide, which we can explain as a disconnect you know, with ourselves. Right? And so I think what I'm hearing from, from these thinkers is that we live in this world of profound disconnection and division. Um, and I've really been inspired by this framing of like, how do we mend those divides? Um, and, and so thinking about infusing you know, deep nature connection into my research and my teaching, um, and thinking about these divides of how do we reconnect to ourselves, to each other, um, and to nature, or what some indigenous folks would say, connecting to all our relations and like recognizing nature as our kin. Um, I've come to kind of to re-envision what I'm doing as human nature reconnection and rewilding environmental education. And this draws on both land-based and indigenous pedagogies and eco-psychology and neuroscience. Um, and really what what these thinkers are talking about is cultural repair um, and how if we do culture, cultural repair right, um, that will reinforce our connection to nature. And if we do reconnect to nature, that will also reinforce uh, connecting to each other and connecting to ourselves. So all three of these are really important to think about together. It's not enough for us to just be a somebody who likes to go off in nature by ourselves and sort of find peace and oneness, um, but never come back and share that passion with each other. We need intergenerational sharing about this. We need sharing with our peers and family members. Um, and so it is really reimagining society, 
not just reimagining how we do sustainability education. So it's about healing disconnection. Um, and I will share also about some core routines that have been recommended for, for doing this in a good way. So I would like to open with uh, a Haudenosaunee Thanksgiving address. Um, I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. But as I share this, um, one of the core routines that's been recommended for this culture repair and nature connection repair is gratitude, is giving thanks. And so for the Haudenosaunee people, I believe also for the Anishinaabe people and many other indigenous cultures that we have here in Turtle Island, um, at the opening of a gathering or a meeting or a celebration, different events, there will often be uh, sharing of thanks um, at the beginning uh, of the gathering to bring everyone together in a good way. So the words that come before all else, I think it's called the Ohenten Kariwatekwan in Mohawk or Ganyankeha language. So the Mohawks being one of the Haudenosaunee um, Confederacy nations. Um, this is an invitation that's been offered to everyone to be using and sharing as it suits you. Um, and so the invitation is to bring our minds together as one and give thanks. Um, and it's often starting with, uh, starting with the people. So I'd like to give thanks to the people who are supporting me to be here today, um, to welcome me and get me all set up with the technology and cr the creation of this technology that enables us to be, um, to be connected um, and to be sharing this recording. Um, so thank you for being here. Um, and thank, just thanking kind of human kin and human community for the support that, that it provides to, to all of us, to each other. I'd like to bring our minds together as one and give thanks to our mother, the earth, who provides everything we need to live a good life. Um, there is uh, so much wonder and beauty that comes from, from nature and from the earth, and I, I'd like to invite us to feel that in our hearts. So I'd like to offer greetings and thanks to the waters uh, for the clean water that we're able to drink, um, for the salt waters of the earth, for the fresh waters, for the rain waters, and for the birth waters for mammals that bring, that bring life um, um, into, that bring new life. Um, I'd like to thank the fish for keeping the waters clean and for offering themselves as food for the roots and bushes and grasses um, that, that extend across Mother Earth that, that provide food for, for so many insects and other beings and for the fruit and berries and grains and vegetables um, and all that good food that we enjoy from the Earth, for the plants that heal us, um, the medicine plants and the people that keep that knowledge of the medicines, for the animals that provide inspiration and um, inspiration in, in their beings, in their beauty, and the way they move in the world, the birds for their beautiful songs, the trees for their shade and support and strength um, and life-giving um, energies, the four winds and the four directions that are still working together to provide fresh air that we can breathe and enjoy, to the uh, elder brother sun that crosses the sky every morning and allows us to mark our days with light and warmth and strength and inspiration, and the grandmother moon that will be full tonight has been looking really beautiful the last two nights, um, and all the cycles uh, that, um, of the tides and of women's cycles that the moon is, uh, is guiding, and the stars that can still guide us if we have the knowledge to interpret their, uh, their directions if we're lost at night. 
and to the spirit beings and protectors and ancestors um, and creator um, for all of their guidance and creation. And if I've forgotten anything, um, an invitation to each of you to continue to, to complete that. And so these are considered the words before all else, or the words that come before the matter that is set down in any given event um, as an indigenous protocol, again, that is meant to be shared. And it's powerful to sort of hear the stories of how when this is done, and it does bring our hearts and minds together as one, you know, if we're here to deliberate and make decisions for our community or for our nation, we can do that in a good way because of this, um, this protocol, because of this way that we've come together to start off in a good way. And I find that really beautiful and inspiring. So I hope you do too. And I've left um, in, the, in, the work, in the handout that I've given you um, a link to a recording of this. Um, another way that I have shared gratitude as an opening in my classes when I'm teaching a class at the University of Waterloo is often to put down uh, in the center of the room an offering uh, or a symbol of a candle for you know the four elements of light uh, on fire rather and and water and clean air and earth which may be some compost from my garden it may be a, a symbol of something that I've picked up on the way to class such as some beautiful goldenrod and asters that are looking amazing at this time of the year. And as I'm giving thanks at the beginning of the class and inviting us to reconnect, at least with those four elements, if not all 14 or more of those beings that were on the last slide, um, I believe this is a, a, another, perhaps a shorter way for us to bring our hearts together um, and to feel um, appreciation um, and getting into that kind of heart space before we proceed with, um, with, with our business. And so, as I shared earlier, gratitude is uh, one of a core routine, one of, one of core routine to connect us to nature and to connect us to each other. So I invite you to just take a minute or two, maybe I'll give you 90 seconds, to chat with somebody beside you and consider what did hearing these words of gratitude, hearing this offering, stir in you? Um, what would it be like if we all took the time to do this regularly? If we all had a strong sense that water and land and all of these beings were our relatives? And if we felt love for these relatives as deeply as we do for our immediate family? So just take one or two minutes. I will call us back with a crow call <laughs> after 90 seconds. So go ahead. So, 
Thank you for taking the time to be building connections with each other, um, catalyzed by that invitation for gratitude. Um, perhaps some of you already incorporate gratitude into your lives and already kind of feel how that makes your being radiate in a different way. I took some time upon um, an invitation from a, uh, a Mohawk elder, Diane Longboat, um, Gahandagwes Diane Longboat, to practice a sunrise ceremony every day for one year in which I would rise with the sun and step outside and, uh, and go through some version of that Thanksgiving address, hold up a glass of water to the light of the day and share a little bit with the land and drink a little bit myself. Um, so there, again, there are many ways that this can happen, but um, it's powerful to, um, to feel into that. I used to just sense that I was just, I feel like I'm a pretty grateful person, um, but I think it, it only gets deeper the more that we feel into that. And, and what I've noticed is that being in the presence of others who are sharing gratitude um, can be very uplifting for me. So I, um, I appreciate the opportunity to share uh, words of gratitude in, in a wider setting of, um, of a talk or of a class that I'm, uh, that I'm teaching. So having acknowledged the land today um, and all its beings, I would also like to acknowledge the people that we're gathered here in the lands of the Anishinaabe and Ojibwe and Haudenosaunee peoples, and I acknowledge the enduring presence and deep traditional knowledge and laws and philosophies um, of these indigenous peoples with whom we share the land today. And acknowledge too that we are all treaty people and we have a responsibility to honor um, and learn about our relations. So, I'm sharing something quite personal today, as well as where I'm going kind of professionally in my research and my teaching um, through my exploration of, of land connection and nature connection in recent years. Um, I believe it's kind of a search for me to learn about who I am and where I live and how I can heal my own relationship to place. And so, why are we doing this? Why does this come up? I'll share again a little, come back to my personal journey in a moment, but I also want to say, why is it important? Why is nature connection important? Well, if we think back to the 1960s when Rachel Carson published Silent Spring, she talked about, you know, this was 60 years ago, why should we tolerate a diet of weak poisons, a home in insipid surroundings, a circle of acquaintances who are not quite our enemies, the noise of motors with just enough relief to prevent insanity, who would want to live in a world which is just not quite fatal? <laughs> I don't know if we've gotten to a world, I don't know if you sense that we're in a world that is not quite fatal, but there certainly are all kinds of, uh, of, of ways that we can look at the world today um, that that resonate and that I think stem to that cultural um, disrepair and a state of disrepair in our relationship with nature and with ourselves. And so again, those, those ideas that I shared at the beginning just keep resonating with me. Um, and I read uh, Richard Louvre, Last Child in the Woods, Saving Our Children from Nature Deficit Disorder. Um, and it, Asks, it invites me to think about the, the, the insights that I keep hearing from so many Indigenous leaders, such as this Inuit elder and author who says, how can we know who we are if we don't know about where we live? You know? And I was an academic for many years who just kind of, I mean, I was interested in food and agriculture, but I feel like I've put sort of nature and land connection much more centrally in to my, my thinking and into my feeling these days um, to kind of really take seriously this kind of question. Um, many, is, yeah, many of us have heard about nature deficit disorder and about the you know, mental health benefits of spending time in nature and perhaps about forest bathing. Um, but I think, again, nature connection goes much deeper than our society recognizes, um, especially when we think about the connections to culture as well. Um, 
it's, it's almost existential, right? So I'm going to be sharing about this personal and uh, an intellectual journey to appreciate the significance and experience um, and use some sort of storytelling um, about how I've, how I've brought this into, into my, my work and my community work. So I feel like there was a series of events that happened um, about six years ago, five or six years ago, that kind of led me to acknowledge that I was in a state of burnout. It was kind of gradual, but there were a few moments when I just started to really acknowledge that. And some advice, a little piece of advice I received at that time, when I was trying to recover from an intense semester of teaching three courses, and, and just didn't feel like I was recovering. I was doing some exercise and yoga and sleeping, and, and I just wasn't recovering. And somebody said, do what you love for at least a few minutes every day. Um, and I think that's really been quite pivotal for me to just pay a little bit more attention to feeling into that question um, and feeling into what am I really you know, curious about and passionate about. Um, and I started to realize that developing relations with the land to paying attention to this question about ways of knowing and being that indigenous cultures and um, really all of our ancestors um, used to do, and how do we view the land as a teacher? I had a mentor at the Guelph Outdoor School who said, the best textbook is a question book. Be curious, ask lots of questions. Why is this happening? Why is this happening? When you're sitting outside and noticing things, and then go home and do the research about it, um, and spark, you know, that passion will continue to be sparked. Um, it's not about following what other people are telling you, but really following, again, what that curiosity and that spark that's inside of you. And so also acknowledging that what leads to deep transformation and taking action in one's life is, is about overcoming that, that separation. Um, some people call this relationality. So I'll come back to that concept of like being in relation and being connected. So just to share a little bit more about my journey, I've found uh, since that time kind of realizing that I wanted to pivot my, uh, both my kind of personal um, hobbies as well as finding space in my, um, in my teaching and my research for, uh, for nature connection. I began seeking out mentors and programs and places to learn. Um, and I did a deep dive about learning about foraging plants this is a picture of a friend of mine in my backyard putting down um, some straw to grow mushrooms. And this week I was harvesting wine cap mushrooms on that spot. Um, I've been learning about herbal medicines. I've been learning about wildlife tracking, which is really mind blowing. I took out some slides from my presentation, but if anyone wants to ask me about that at the end, I can, I can share a little bit more. Um, it's mind-blowing. Um, naturalist skills, bushcraft and survival skills, nature-based crafts, even learning a little bit about bow hunting, um, not to the point of actually hunting, but, but learning archery this year, um, and sharing circles and circle pedagogy. I don't know if any of you have had a chance to kind of be in circle in which, you know, maybe there's a talking piece or just symbolically, we're all taking turns for deep listening Maybe we're starting by sharing gratitude. I'm often doing that in my class after I kind of set up in the morning and invite people to just share the road dust, you know, get rid of whatever, you know, angst you're holding and just so that we can come together in a good way. If you need to tell us about the traffic or what happened to you on the way here to this morning or something you're really excited about doing tonight, get that off your chest, share some gratitude, just check in and then we can come together in a good way. And so that use of sharing circles um, has been really powerful in my teaching and in groups that I've been part of. Um, and the other one thing I heard was an invitation to like get to know one's own land-based practices of your ancestry. Um, and I'm not very far along on learning that, but I'm curious about that too. So with all this talk about noticing things in nature, I wanted to give you another few moments maybe a minute or two, to chat again with a neighbor here, maybe somebody that you haven't chatted with yet, and just to share what have you noticed in nature recently. I'll give you a minute or two and do a crow call.
All right, thank you. So I'm curious to know, how did that actually feel? Not what you talked about, but what did you notice was sparked in your being? What happens to your body when you retell what you've noticed or experiences, or what does it awaken in us? Would anyone like to share? Yes. The bats no longer have a home. Coyotes are running and, and raccoons, all because of an area that was clear cut out by cranberry. Hearing grief, which, which suggests to me that you're connecting with your emotions and your feelings about how much you care about the land. Yeah, so thank you for sharing that. Anyone else like to share what your body was feeling as you were sharing with friends or as you were hearing your friends share with you? Yeah. Uplifted. Right. Yeah. I mean, there are all kinds of things we can be noticing in nature, um, and all kinds of things we can be noticing as we're driving past, you know, Walmart and everything else that kind of used to be beautiful nature. Um, so yes, if we're focusing on what we are feeling love for, we are feeling uplifted. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, um, I hope that others of you noticed that as well. So. One of the points here is that when we're viewing nature, like let's imagine we're science students, um, we are often having a purely kind of analytical lens. I'm here like taking my notes in the lab or doing my tree inventory in the forest. Um, and that, the way we proceed to do that kind of teaching and learning is sort of setting us up for separation or disconnection. I was actually encouraged chatting with one of my colleagues late, recently who's trained in biology and teaches ecology classes and he said, yeah, you know, Stephanie, when I took my students out to do forest inventory, I would tell them to just spend some time being silent in the forest, have some contemplation and, and then feel into that. And that was really beautiful to hear that as a scientist in an ecology course that he would create space for doing that, um, and I feel like we need a lot more of that to overcome this sense of separation and disconnection. But, um, but going back to you know feeling uplifted and inspired and connected, I've been really intrigued by um, again wilderness awareness educator John Young, who talks about eight attributes of people who experience deep nature connection, and he has a TED talk about this among many other places you can learn more. Um, but he talks about that sense of inner peace and calm, um, the sense of joy and happiness, you know, that's associated with, you know, childhood wonder, that vitality, that inner excitement and motivation, curiosity, um, and that capacity for unconditional listening, which, um, again, comes from having had those kind of contemplative experiences, then you yourself can be changed and be a better um, and more compassionate um, listener to other people in your community, in your life. Um, sense of empathy and connection. A sense of helpfulness. This is really intriguing to me. It's this sense that we can, that we all have unique gifts um, or talents or passions and that those are meant to be shared and that as we connect more with the nature and more with ourselves and in a good way with community members, that our gifts will begin to shine. And that, um, yeah, it's quite beautiful to just realize that that can happen and automatically we can be, you know, more helpful or we can be of service in different ways to the world around us. Um, it doesn't mean we're all going to become nature educators or, you know, um, there's, there's all kinds of other ways. Maybe we're going to be a concert pianist, but even by doing, by being a concert pianist, having a strong connection to nature will make us shine in whatever way we're going to go out in the world um, and, and be, be talented. Right? And so it's this sense of being fully alive, um, awe, reverence, gratitude, love, and compassion. Isn't that a beautiful vision? And again, John Young's work, and it's been backed up by many others, and John Young has spent um, the last four or five decades looking at cultures around the world and saying, what are the common elements of cultural connection and nature connection? And how do they do that mentoring intergenerationally? Um, and that this is what it brings about. 
Like that's pretty exciting and transformative and we need more of that in our society. So I've been intrigued to learn more and figure out how do we do more of this, you know, whether it's in my faculty of environment, my context at the University of Waterloo, or in my community, or catalyzing um, opportunities elsewhere um, for everyone. Um, so there are some more scholarly publications that try to look at connectedness as a core conservation concern. How do we define connectedness with nature? Well, on the one hand, we realize it is very personal, and yet, um, if we need to boil it all down, um, the academic literature has said that connectedness, connection with nature is a stable state of consciousness comprising cognitive, affective, and experiential traits that reflect through consistent attitudes and behaviors a sustained awareness of that interrelatedness between oneself and the rest of nature. So that sense of oneness, and that's Again, pretty special if we can start to feel that. Um, connectedness with nature is more than just a simple contact. It's not just being outside. It's not just quantity of time outside, but there is something qualitative. It's not the just simple contact or superficial enjoyment of nature. It's an enduring appreciation, empathy, and mindfulness of the intrinsic value and shared essence of all life. And that may include acknowledging the unesthetic or unappealing elements um, or the less useful elements to humans. So it's not about hedonism or speciesism or functional utilitarianism. And uh, apologies for all that jargon. This wasn't my quote. <laughs> um, but it's also connected to a commitment to action. Um, whether that's resolving to respect and take responsibility for conserving nature. It doesn't mean that we're all going to be activists, but we can show care and love for nature in other ways. Um, we can drive a little more slowly so there's less roadkill. It's incredible how much roadkill I saw just driving here yesterday. Um, so there's other just myriad ways that we can think about being committed stewards. Right? And so we realize then that land connection or nature connection is about a deep relationship, not just being outside, right? And so being in deep relationship is not like being in a museum or being a tourist, um, being in this kind of recreational setting of going hiking or camping. I mean, that can lead to deep nature connection, but it doesn't always. I know many people in the nature connection kind of community teaching about tracking and bushcraft skills, and they've described their transformation from growing up being quite active in recreational settings and camping settings, and then said that their mind was blown apart when they took a workshop on tracking and they started to realize how deeply you can be in relationship to the land and, and know what's going on. Um, so it's not that transactional and instrumental approach um, you know, of many gardeners in which, you know, I want to have a really nice aesthetic or I want to have a really productive vegetable garden. Again, there's something else um, if we go deeper to feel that oneness, to feel that relationality um, that, again, takes deep nature connection to get to. And, and I'm only a little bit way along this journey, but I'm appreciating what's happening in myself as I go deeper and I'm surveying like many other people to hear what their experience has been um, and how transformative that can be. Um, so if you're a birder, it's not just about having a checklist of, oh, I've seen this many birds and da 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 da, -da. I can recognize this many calls. That also can be a stepping stone, but is not necessarily a sufficient condition to feel that deep sense of connection, right? Or a master naturalist who can identify every plant in an area. So. Coming back to love, coming back to that like heart feeling passion. Um, I was inspired by a couple of quotes that I came across here, going back to eco-philosopher and naturalist Aldo Leopold, who said, it's inconceivable to me that an ethical relation to land can exist without love, respect, and admiration for the land. So again, how do we, you know, I said at the beginning, sustainability education, and nature connection are two very different processes. 
So that's what comes up for me when I see this, is how do we instill love and respect and ads admiration? What are the core routines that can get us there? And it's usually not sitting in the classroom, right? We must learn to fall in love with the land in order to defend it. This has really stuck with me since I heard Diane Longboat, um, Gahandagwas Diane Longboat mentioned that several years ago. And I just got curious to like, what does that look like? What does that mean? How do we get there? Um, so that's been piquing my curiosity, right? As we recognize how our culture, or maybe we shouldn't say culture, but our society has become deeply disconnected from the land, from each other, and from ourselves. Another quote here that brings up love from Native American author, poet, and actor, um, John Trudell, who says that all human beings are descendants of tribal people who were spiritually alive, intimately in love with the natural world, children of Mother Earth. When we were tribal people, we knew who we were. We knew where we were. We knew our purpose. The sacred perception of reality remains alive and well in our genetic memory. We carry it inside of us, usually in a dusty box in the mind's attic, but it is accessible, right? Don't give up. If we look around and we say we are a pretty disconnected society, um, but don't give up. Um, that's reminding me, I'm not, here, I'm not bringing a lot of spirituality into this talk, um, but it is certainly linked in some ways, and I came across this book some of you may be interested in recently by Karen Armstrong called Sacred Nature, Restoring Our Ancient Bond with the Natural World. So again, that kind of resonates um, as I'm reading this quote. So it's, uh, it's striking to think about how this is everyone's birthright, right? And all of our ancestors are people who descended from land-based cultures or we wouldn't be here. All people have been connected through ancient land-based relationships, um, whether it's fire making, hunting, weaving, um, plant medicines, and many, many more skills and practices. Um, and if we, a lot of us from European backgrounds, we look back at Christianity spreading through Europe and beyond, a lot of land-based relationships were condemned or were reframed under the auspices of a, of a Christian god. Um, and so Europeans became disconnected from their land-based lifeways and spirituality. And the rise of science and industrialism just reinforced this separation in many ways. And so I think it's important to recognize that many Europeans experienced trauma. Our ancestors, you know, many generations back, experienced trauma um, that were enacted on the lands and peoples. Um, also when those Europeans were traveling elsewhere and colonizing and settling elsewhere. Um, and so this, there was a trauma in multiple cultures through these processes of disconnection, right? And then settler colonialism in the Americas, forcing the removal of indigenous peoples and severing lifeways um, to their lands. And so I think it's important to realize just the importance of healing um, that's needed among all people to recover from the traumas of separation from land and land-based lifeways. So I will share um, a little bit more about core routines um, to, to rebuild, to do that cultural repair, um, to connect to each other and connect to the land. I've shared a bit about giving thanks and the role of gratitude as one practice. There's many other practices um, that are talked about in this book by John Young. It's over 500 pages, um, in which he explains about how we expand our sensory awareness by being in nature, by learning about tracking, by questioning. I talked about the importance of having a question book um, to keep track of what you're curious about and what you're learning about. Um, just the timeless wandering, um, the importance of bird language, which I'll come back to in a moment, it's also mind-blowing. Um, learning about animal forms and, and how, again, inspired and how much we can learn by trying to imitate animals. Um, journaling, 
using our sensory memory so that when we had an experience in nature and we want to come back and either tell somebody about it or journal about it, and we're kind of reliving it, you know, not just in our head and in our eyes, but through all of our senses. John Young, who was mentored with these practices from the age of 10, he has an amazing capacity of listening to his wife talk about this. He's now in his early 60s, and she said he can take you back to an experience he had when he was 13 and tell you what he was, what he was noticing. You know, there was a fox and there was a bird and this was happening in the sky and the weather. And because he has such a capacity to sort of embody and feel back with all his senses, he was journaling about it when he went home that night. And that's, you know, still living in his body and in his mind all these years later. So that's pretty awe-inspiring. Right? We can think about learning how to map spaces that we're spending time in. Um, field guides are useful. If you've got to look up information and figure out, yes, it is helpful to be, you know, like, what are the kinds of foxes? What are the kinds of birds that live in my environment? When I first took a tracking course, um, it was called Reading Nature's Language with Chris Gilmore at Chris Outdoors. And I remember the invitation. He said, well, make a master list of all the mammals in your area. No idea what kind of mammals live in my area, you know, because every time I'm going out walking, I'm probably creating too much disturbance to even see them, right? So then it was quite, yeah, mind blowing to even realize, oh, like we have these animals in this area, or we used to have these animals in this area, but now they've been pushed out. So just getting in touch with that, um, you know, who are our neighbors? Who are the beings that coexist? in our bioregion, um, and learning about survival and bushcraft. So all of those can help to expand our senses and all these other experiences, our core routines for nature connection. Two more that I'll share a little bit about later are about the sit spot and about the story of, story of the day and how we kind of share out what we've been learning to reinforce our, our learning and share that inspiration. I left off sharing that there are some wonderful core routines, um, and I will share more about that in a minute, but I also want to spend some time think, acknowledging um, that there are members of the indigenous communities around Turtle Island and beyond that have had some concerns about f folks coming and talking about survival living and talking about skills of making fires and learning to track and all of that, and they're saying, Maybe this is cultural appropriation. You denied us the ability to practice our culture. Now you're teaching this culture, and what's going on? Um, this doesn't seem quite appropriate. So the concerns have been that nature connection is not neutral on stolen indigenous land in a settler-built nation. Um, ancestral skills are not neutral on stolen land. Survival skills are not neutral on stolen land. And so the call is that it must be anti-racist um, or it's explicitly complicit with racism and anti-indigeneity and anti-blackness. So I think these concerns have to be taken seriously. And I think there have been lots of soul-searching discussions in folks around Turtle Island that are um, involved in teaching about nature connection. Um, there's a coyotes program in Montreal, and so they had some very inspiring words on their website, and from what I gather, folks I know at the Guelph Outdoor School have been connected with them and have been saying um, that they're doing some very inspiring work. So this is an image of them teaching about the two-row wampum treaty, speaking about nation-to-nation -nation dialogue and mutual respect. Um, Maybe it's not fully decolonizing nature connection, but they are paying attention to those critiques and thinking about what they can do and how they can um, be in better relation with indigenous communities. I had a grant um, currently from the Center for Teaching Excellence at the University of Waterloo to prepare resources for educators to incorporate nature connection activities into, um, into teaching and learning. And we are also interviewing, in the process of interviewing educators who are doing this work. Um, but we're also asking, where do you see harm um, in terms of potential appropriation in this kind of, um, in this field of work? How do you um, do this work in the context of being 
on indigenous land? How can you know, organizations who share these concerns about nature connection go about building relations with local indigenous peoples in good ways? Um, are there specific activities that you have used to promote you know, an anti-racist or a decolonial framework in how you're encouraging people to learn about nature connection, right? Or how do we create the conditions to support each other, to see the harm in our work um, in a way that promotes reflection and repair? So I'm really excited about what will be revealed through these interviews. They're probably going to be published as podcasts on To Know the Land. Um, podcast, which my friend um, in Guelph runs, and he's collaborating with me. So I think that's going to be important work. Um, and to share a little bit more about what's going on at this program in Montreal. So some of what they've shared is that since connecting people to the outdoors, it builds empathy for life. And so this work can evoke questions about how to be in right relations with the land and the peoples that were stewards, that have been stewards of this land. So how can I be a caretaker of the plants and animals and, and beings here? How, can, how has this land been cared for in the past? And how can I honor the people who have um, done that before settlers arrived? Uh, they've also shared about the native communities here and worldwide have been persecuted for the way that they relate to the land. Um, and here we are, having learned from them and are attempting to rekindle our ancestral relationship to the earth. So uh, just acknowledging that cultural misappropriation is a risk, and for the land-based communities that are no longer around, um, we need to grieve for them and celebrate their existence and tell those stories. So I find it beautiful how they're making efforts to these efforts. There's always more that can be done, but I think these are important steps to be addressing those, those concerns. And here's some other more specific, concrete things that um, they're trying to do at the Coyotes program um, in their Nature Connection work. So learning the names um, and names and peoples of the places that we inhabit, you know? Um, learning about the struggles that these people went through and continue to experience. Just to pause for a moment, you're probably familiar, you know, in the last few years that there's many examples of, let's start this event with a land acknowledgement. This is the land of so-and-so and so-and-so, -and -so, you know, and then, okay, let's go on with business. And it, it kind of pains me to hear that. I, I'm sure that you've heard critiques of this as well. I like opening with a land acknowledgement and opening, you know, it, and, and starting, or Thanksgiving address rather, and like sharing thankfulness for many of the beings and the peoples, <clears throat> but I, and I think that we can go further to be thinking about like, how are these people doing currently? Like these people still exist. Um, and how, how are they doing in their struggles for continuing to exist and practice their culture? Um, so so that's, that's what comes up for me in relation to that, right? And we can be giving space for in, <clears throat> indigenous teachers to be invited to lead activities and teach about their culture and history. Um, inviting participants to learn about cultural heritage and connecting them, um, cultural heritage that has connected them to their land, um, right? So we can be learning if we're descendants of European peoples, again, what are the um, practices of my peoples um, in, in connecting to land? in the past um, and currently, right? And acknowledging the human brilliance behind the ancient survival skills that we continue to practice and acknowledging the teachers that help keep those traditions alive. Um, so acknowledging these traditional peoples on a regular basis, sharing opportunities to contribute resources, to educate ourselves and build those bridges and understanding, calling out inappropriate behavior, talking about myths and realities of Native communities. I was talking with somebody, Dorothy, over the break about that here in Collingwood, um, and learning the history of the land that we're on through an ecological and human perspective, right? So I think it's been inspiring to learn about that and to consider, again, how we can deepen our practice in lots of different contexts. I also learned about the Nature Connection Network. And again, they've got some, they've been doing some good work talking about how we believe in reparations, land back, reparative healing, that healing requires an assessment of the sources of our material well-being, including addressing cultural misappropriation, right? And talking about how children have the right to know the complex history 
um, and multiple truths about colonization and cultural appropriation and how that continues to impact all of us today. They say we believe in the centering, centering living systems and indigenous worldviews in our decisions and designs and commitments. Right? So I think there are ways forward, um, even though this um, can be very divisive and, and feel very politicized. Um, another invitation which I put on your worksheet is again for all of us to be doing this work for ourselves, to be learning about land history and land stories, learning about the treaty that covers the land that you live on or the land that you grew up on, right? What's the name of that treaty? What lands are covered? Are these treaties being honored? In what ways? Right? And, and maybe getting to know some members of the Indigenous community here and, um, and hearing their stories. Right? So I read that Collingwood is part of the lands of the Lake Simcoe Natawasaga Treaty of 1818. So there's an invitation to go and do some, do some homework and do some research, chat with your friends and see where that leads. Um, but, but yeah, just consider what are the ways for us to support struggles of Indigenous peoples whose land we reside on. Last weekend, um, in the south of Kitchener, there's been, I think, 180 hectares of land called Wajindaman, which are now under indigenous stewardship through the city of Kitchener and the Grand River Conservation Authority, handing that over to be managed through several indigenous groups. Um, and they had a tree planting activity, and they had a feast, and they had an area to walk around the land and have a tour and hear about the native plants and hear about the visions of how that land's going to be used as an outdoor classroom for urban indigenous youth. Um, it's really beautiful to be able to come together and meet members of that community and support the work that they're doing, just as one example. Another example, um, uh, at the University of Waterloo, we have a small patch of forest on campus and that has just recently been designated as a healing forest. So this national designation that's happening in places across the country for healing forests is to be providing space for settlers and indigenous people to be learning about and, and, and healing from the traumas of residential schools and missing and murdered indigenous women and girls and so on. And, um, and so how can we create a place that supports that education and that healing? So that's a place where settler um, community members at the university can be stepping up and helping to create, um, create that space so that we can all benefit from and, and learn from and be together. So those are a few examples of how to do this in a good way. Uh, okay, so I wanted to come back to a few more of these sensory awareness um, experiences and what does it look like and then share a little bit more about what I'm doing to, to bring this to um, the university community. So I think I said earlier that tracking, learning about wildlife tracking or wilderness um, awareness can be really mind-blowing. Here's a quote that kind of caps, caps, encapsulates some of that. Tracking, it turns out, is nothing less than a paradigm an ecological way of knowing, a green hermeneutics, is not just a way of seeing how things are connected. It's a discipline that redefines and expands what connection and relationship even is. Maybe that feels a bit far out, um, but let me give you some examples. So another book that John Young wrote is called What the Robin Knows how birds reveal the secrets of the natural world. And before you, you may be like me. In the past, there was like a wall of green. I didn't really know too much about plant identification. There was a wall of birds. I didn't know too much about bird identification. I'm still, I'm chipping away at that, no pun intended, um, to learn more about who are the birds in my neighborhood. But what this book teaches you is that it's really not about um, learning all those bird species, but it's about appreciating how birds um, can tell us about what's going on in our landscape. So you'll see in the image here on the front of the book, there's a person walking, there is, I think what's probably a coyote, maybe an owl, a cat, um, a hawk, um, and a deer, and a robin, and other birds in the environment can be talking about using their bird language to tell each other um, about 
the presence of all these, you know, disturbances in their environment. So the songbirds in particular are a good one to start with, robins and other birds. Robins are down on the ground as well as being up high. So <clears throat> being down on the ground, a robin might be worried about a cat, right? A bird up high might really not care if a cat's walking by because that's not potentially disturbing them. So robins and other songbirds that are on the ground as well as up high will be able to tell you about all kinds of disturbances high and low. So let's pay attention to robins. What happens? Let's pretend you're a hiker. You're walking down a trail. You're minding your own business. You're maybe looking at the plants, walking along. Your presence walking along is creating a bit of disturbance. You may not even realize that, right? But, but the birds around you probably do realize that. Um, and they may be flying away. And there may be deer um, not too far away. And they're also noticing, because they have tremendous capacity to, uh, to smell um, and to hear, um, and a little bit less capacity to see movement, but they're pretty good. Um, as well at that. Um, and so the birds and the deer and the other beings in the environment will be talking to each other about disturbances, whether it's a disturbance from this hiker, whether it's a disturbance from other potential predators. Um, but what happens is you have this zone of awareness, but it, there's a much bigger bubble or ripple of, of impact of that zone of disturbance. Even if you just walk into the forest and just sit down, it might take a long time for, for the forest to get back to that baseline of before you were there. Maybe it never will, because they're just, those animals around you are just sensing your, your, um, your impact and your energy. So what I'm saying is that um, animals have these alarm calls, and if we begin to tune into what those alarm calls sound like, we can be aware of so much more that's going on. And just to give one example about that, I, as I started to learn a bit about tracking and bird language and paying attention to alarm calls, I started to realize what the alarm calls of the squirrels sounded like, because I have a lot of um, gray squirrels in my backyard. And there were two occasions when I was inside my house or just on my front doorstep, and I started to hear alarm calls of squirrels and alarm calls of crows and I paid attention to what was going on, and wouldn't you know it, but on those two occasions, there was a fox. There's not many foxes that come into my neighborhood, but there, those were the two times that there was a fox, and the animals told me that there was a fox there. So I think that's pretty amazing how, again, if we just start to tune in, and I'm not very far along on this journey, just a few years in, um, that's the level of awareness. And again, if you go out and take a year-long tracking program, your mind will be blown by the way that trackers can read the landscape. Little signs, you know, on a tree, and they can interpret, like, who was there? When were they there? What happened? What's the story? It's not just about this footprint equates to this animal, but what was the whole story of what that animal was doing? Was that animal pursuing another animal? Was it being pursued? You know, where was it going? How is it interacting with its environment? Um, maybe this all feels very um, uh, far out for people who you know, are really hardcore, um, spending a lot of time outside. But the other interesting benefit, I think, of being able to tune in in this way, in a deep way, is that we become not only conscious of what's going on around us, but conscious of how we are creating ripples, right? What is the sphere of disturbance that we're creating, and how could we actually calm our own energies so that we're moving in the world in a different way, and as we become more kind of self-aware of our own energies, that, like I said earlier, you know, maybe that makes us more present for people around us. Maybe that builds our capacity for compassion and empathy and unconditional listening, and so on. So. Again, it can have all these unintended consequences um, of connecting to nature and having all these social and emotional consequences for ourselves. So Paul Resendez, who wrote The Wild Within, said that these kind of practices allow people to drop their everyday persona until you know, the forest 
the environment that they're in no longer requires, no longer realizes that they're, that they're there. Like you're no longer creating a disturbance. Um, when you become the forest, when you're silent inwardly and outwardly, the forest starts to wake up and to move. And it's quite amazing what can happen. I was chatting with somebody at the break about just the simple act of going barefoot. You know, even if you do barefoot indoors, like suddenly I'm so much aware, so much more aware of my body if I take off my shoes, right? I'm feeling that carpet, right? And when or I'm walking through my house and I'm going from the wood floor to the floor in the kitchen, and it's just like, oh, like just something is registering. Like there's just some level of awareness um, that wasn't there before because I had these coffins on my feet, <laughs> to use a term that... Uh, that, um, uh, yes, um, um, my friend, a tracker, told me. Um, yeah, it was, it, was pretty, it was pretty striking. I did a program at the Manitoulin Eco Park this summer with Skeet Sutherland from Sticks and Stones Wilderness School. That was, it was his term. And, um, and that was in mid-July. And he was just talking about how amazing it was to get more in tune with your body by going barefoot. So for the next six weeks at least, until we had a whole lot of wasps eating our grapes outside, um, I was going barefoot inside and outside. I was going out to my garden a couple times a day and take out the compost and so on. And uh, yeah, it, it has been quite phenomenal. So even if it's only indoors, just try it out and see what it does for your body awareness. Right? Suddenly, you know, we're no longer a spectator, but we're just, we're a little more embodied. So um, I really recommend that. All right, so I've shared a lot about my personal journey, about nature connection practices and different skills and, um, and so on that I've been trying out. I want to share a little bit more about how I'm bringing this into my teaching and research. So one of the things I did um, in a couple of food system sustainability classes that I was teaching um, and we just submitted a paper to the Journal of Transformative Education that talks about this experience and what what we were trying to elicit in my students um, so the paper is called fostering relationality in sustainable food systems education through experiential contemplative and community-based um, assignments um, so uh, we talked about how the study explores whether, um, how do we foster relationality through specific um, assignments that students can be given. Um, so relationality being like this understanding that human beings are profoundly and dynamically connected to all living beings and ecosystems, right? That's another word for this connection that I've been talking about promoting, right? So how do we... Um, so we found that through specific activities that we'd given the students to work on, there was a growing sense of self-awareness and deepening connection to community and to nature. Um, and it was amazing, even in a fully asynchronous online course, students didn't even meet me. It was an online course that they were working on independently, but we were able to achieve some of those goals. So I'll come back to that in a second. I, I also wanted to talk about how um, we got some funding this year from the UW Sustainability Action Fund from the Sustainability Office um, to bring in all kinds, of um, all kinds of teachers to share about land skills. And we talked about how this is good for wellness, you know, mental health, physical activity um, and well-being, as well as sustainability of more nature connection um, at the University of Waterloo. And so we brought in people to do spoon carving and basket weaving and teach about um, how to forage and grow and make um, herbal medicines for dealing with stress. Um, and we had a great time. So it's quite, um, yeah, it was just exciting that we were able to actually bring this to university community, students, staff, faculty members, um, and to be able to try to cultivate more relationality, right? This understanding that human beings are, are connected and, and that and that they have a personal connection with nature. Um, so speaking about that, I also wanted to jump, yeah, I have a friend on campus, um, another professor, and she assigned, she was teaching a course called Peace and the Environment. And one of the activities she had her students do was every week, 
can't remember how many times a week, a couple times a week for the whole semester, they were invited to go and spend 20 or 30 minutes sitting outside in the same spot every week. So that was called a sit spot for 20 or 30 minutes. And then afterwards, so just tune in with all your senses. And she said, tune in with your six senses. So, you know, was, was intuition telling you anything in, in addition to other five senses? And journal about that um, and submit that at the end of term. And I was talking to her about what the benefits were of having students do that. And she said, you know, for some people, it was the first time they realized that they could have their own personal relationship with nature. And as she said that, I feel like that was kind of new for me too. It's like, really? Okay. Probably the sunrise ceremony, doing that every, year, every day for a year, which I did after talking to her about that. I think that that brought me um, into a greater appreciation of that sense of my own personal relationship with nature. So that can be quite beautiful and transformative. Um, so getting back to what I did with this class of students that I didn't even meet because it was an asynchronous online course that they were taking. I had this contemplative assignment um, and it, it also sparked relationality, um, right, of, of them being introspective and thinking about deep sense of, or feeling into that deep sense of gratitude and care towards seeds and the plants and food. So what we did was it was called a seed contemplation. And students started by connecting to place and wonder and gratitude, using their senses, holding a seed. We invited them to get, hold, get a seed. You know, you can beg for one, you can buy one, you can borrow one, <laughs> but have a, a seed that can grow food examine it closely, pay attention to what it looks like so you can pick it out from a whole bowl of other seeds if possible, right? Notice the colors and patterns of the seed. Notice the shapes and textures of its surface. Notice its weight and its temperature, how it feels in the palm of your hand or between your fingers, and do this for at least a couple of minutes. So again, not thinking about it, feeling with your body into that, right? And so students' responses to, they were then invited to, um, to sow that seed and nurture that seed over the whole semester um, and, and eventually to write about how that, um, how that seed's growth was a metaphor for your own learning journey that semester. I was so excited when I actually I read this um, activity from, from another professor um, and I wanted to try it out on my students and I was blown away by the responses I get. One of the students sent me a whole book of poetry <laughs> and other people had artwork and photographs and these like bringing me to tears, right? What I was hearing back from these students that I'd never even sat in the classroom with. Um, so students' responses um, were, were really uh, incredibly moving. Um, there's one quote from a student who was like planting a cucumber seed and then developing this relationality towards food and the land and talking about how cucumbers were not just something to buy but they were a living uh, plant to be nurtured and these interactions, right, it was so different from getting cucumbers at Walmart or Costco because I was interacting with these cucumbers every day and like watching them grow and having that connection that she said, having this connection with my food also taught me how to treat myself better. That feels really powerful. Um, I thought to myself, these cucumbers are teaching me to do little things every day to accomplish my goals. So I feel like this is helping us in small ways, maybe in big ways, to cultivate this kin-centric ecology. And on your handout, I put um, a couple of sources from Robin Wall Kimmer and others that I think um, also embody this sense of kinship with the ecology, with this living world around us. Uh, some of you may know um, Robert McFarlane, British um, writer. Um, he's got many beautiful books. And I, in an interview recently I read, he said he doesn't like use the word environment. He likes the word, you know, living world. Um, or earth, living earth. I thought that was interesting. That was, that really, um, I felt that, you know, that the, the word environment can feel very 
cold and separate. So I like that invitation to think about that living world or that living earth um, as a language for um, all our relations around us, right? Um, just to share one more piece from uh, one of my students in that class who did that activity with the seed contemplation. So Conrad poetically crafts the story of planting his seeds and protecting the blueberry bush that was under siege by rabbits. This resulting gratitude and celebration and connection to plants was shared with a joyful flourish. He said, if we value the land, we need to protect it. If we value people, we need to protect them. If we value a blueberry bush, we need to protect it. The fact that I haven't even tasted the fruits of the blueberry bush means very little because I have the privilege of having a pantry full of foods just a few steps away. But the sweat and labor that has gone into its protection and eventual growth have been beyond re rewarding. And my treasure is alive. My treasure is alive. My treasure is alive and it will survive. Its roots will hold and it will thrive. My treasure is alive. It's the breeze shakes the blueberry bush a little and I wave back at it. I understand. Like, that's the kind of like response that was bringing me to tears when I was reading. Like, what can this evoke? Like, what have I, this sort of groundswell that I have released just by assigning students this optional activity in my class. There was lots of other things they were reading more concretely or tangibly about, um, about food system sustainability, but I feel like this goes a long way to something that's really going to potentially stay with them for the rest of their lives. So treasure, right, is considered something to honor and protect, not a commodity. Um, students shared many joys and gratitude for the plants that they, um, as they watched them grow. Um, you know, and even when plants didn't grow, and students were able to acknowledge that failure is OK. Um, and that feels like a powerful life lesson as well, right? <laughs> to not come down so hard on themselves if like something's going wrong and they can't tend this plant successfully. They can still have some self-acceptance and some self-compassion, and that's also a lesson. So it was, yeah, really beautiful to hear all of the takeaways from this. Um, connecting the ways, ways of knowing and being in relation to the land. Um, <clears throat> All right, I want to wrap up in the next five minutes or so, so we've got some time for questions, but yeah, building these relationships with the land. So we've talked about expressing gratitude. Um, other ways can be, you know, knowing your farmer and knowing the chains, the food supply chains of how this food comes to your dinner plate, right? Um, and I've already talked about knowing and supporting indigenous people whose land we re rely on. So. These are all different ways that we can get more in touch with the land and the people um, that are connected to that land, right? So greeting and honoring the land. I had uh, students on a field trip last year. Um, there's a, an indigenous garden that's on the north side of Waterloo campus, and it's managed by an urban indigenous gardening collective. Um, and so we did a field trip there, and Dave Skeen, who was hosting us, he invited students to take a little pinch of tobacco. And he said, just go and see where you feel called to on this land. Maybe it's a tree, maybe it's a plant, maybe it's in the grass. Put down that tobacco and introduce yourself to that plant. Introduce yourself to that land in your own words, right? Like you're meeting a friend. Um, and that is something that, again, really stuck with the students when they were talking later and writing later about that experience of just having that personal connection to land and that sense of relationality and that sense that the land is feeling um, our energy and, um, and is, and is uh, sensing us, right? That's quite beautiful. And that, I know if anyone's followed Thomas Hubel and the Collective uh, Trauma and Healing Summit, which I think is going on this month, he talks about the importance for trauma healing is like, I feel you feeling me, right? That sense of like, sense of connection, whether it's with land or whether it's somebody else, like holding space for your healing. Um, so that's what's coming to mind for me when I think about those kind of direct connections with, with place and with the beings in that land, right? So I've been talking about this multi-sensory awareness of place, the sense of attunement and embodiment, as opposed to just like 
dispassionately kind of numbing ourselves to all these sensory experiences of being and of animism of the earth around us, right? And so I think the final practice that I didn't talk about yet was about storytelling, and um, that may or may not tie in also with sort of celebrations of natural cycles, but this idea of like sharing the story of the day. So at the Guelph, these are just my students on a, on a field trip, but um, yeah, at the end of the field trip that we've been walking around an organic farm and learning about what's going on, we can come together and share, well, what, what's the takeaway for you? What's a highlight for you? What's something you want to learn more about? Or what's, what are you inspired by? You know, and just doing that on a regular basis, whether it's in the classroom, whether it's with your family members, um, is a practice that reinforces connection to place and like reliving those experiences and that can inspire other people and it can reinforce those experiences in your own memory. That is kind of also that heart level connection with all our relations because um, we've had that profound experience of, of being outside um, with these beings and, and just feeling like we're cared for and raised in a community that, that supports and wants to um, yeah, reinforce that, that learning and that connection. Um, building community, yeah. So this is a photograph from the Guelph Outdoor School where both in the adult programs and the kids programs they have this practice at the end um, of every day and they also invite people to share what they're feeling grateful for. And like I was invited time and again to do this um, in different programs because I've been doing adult programs there for the last few years and what I realized is that it's bringing me to a heart-centered place to be in a circle in which everybody's sharing their gratitude. What are you feeling grateful for in nature? What have you noticed in nature? Like that's just a really beautiful thing and I feel transformed by having been in, the, in that kind of group and being held in that kind of circle of um, a loving circle of support. So I think we're often afraid to talk about love and talk about our hearts in our everyday world and how can we create more opportunities for doing that is, um, yeah, something that I wanted to bring with you today. I think I don't have time to talk more about mentoring, but that's another aspect of, again, reinforcing and catching those stories and, and reinforcing that learning, especially between generations and how that's contributing to culture repair. Um, also, haven't had time to talk about grief, but I will point you to, you know, that as we come, I think somebody was sharing earlier, right, about nature connection and that there's grief attached to that when we see nature being destroyed. And so, and sort of a next step of where I'm going is I'm really keen to bring more opportunities to the community at the University of Waterloo, especially in the faculty of environment. How do we hold space for our grief and anxiety that is so heavy? Um, students are feeling it and they're not often having a place to talk about it or feel it um, in, the, in our courses. And that's turning some of them away. Like maybe they're just dropping out of the program. They came into environmental studies because they were all excited about loving the world and supporting the world, um, supporting Mother Earth, and then they just get depressed. So how do we build them up again? So I've been inspired by Joanna Macy's work, and I want to find places, um, as she says, discovering and experiencing connections with each other um, and the self-healing powers of the web of life transforms despair and overwhelm into inspired collect collaborative action. All right, so um, yeah, so I want to find space for more of that. I'm trying to wrap up here so we can have hear more conversations from all of you. Um, final couple of quotes here. So settler descended peoples and guests on these lands um, that we call Canada must learn their own ancestors' ways of knowing, um, knowing the land. And Sharon Blackie says that we need to focus on coming back to our bodies, beginning to repossess our instincts, beginning to reclaim our connection to land and non-human inhabitants. Sharon Blackie's a really beautiful author, if any of you um, are looking for more things to read. Yeah, so I've shared a lot about um, different ways of connecting to land, um, you know, as individual um, people and how I'm bringing that to, um, to my teaching. And just to share that this really leads to learning outcomes, you know, beyond the, the curriculum. So we're 
We're rekindling all kinds of connections. Um, and as I said before, this is important because the way we often think about sustainability education is, is not typically doing this. So I think it's a really potent um, way to sort of shift culture and shift education. Um, and I want to leave time for questions and reflections. And so potentially you can um, be thinking now or thinking in the hours and days after, after today about um, do you feel that you are in a relationship with this land and place? And what are some practices that you have adopted or that you could try out to feel more connected to the living world? Thank you for being here today. Thank you.